Welcome to a new episode of Game Dev Advice with Animal Well Creator Billy Basso. We had a wide ranging conversation about the development of the game and his game development journey so far in the industry. Hope you find it helpful and interesting. Please click the like and subscribe button. Thanks. Hey, Billy, how you doing? Good. How's it going? Doing pretty well. Um, thanks for sticking up here and, and doing this tonight. Yeah, of course. Cool. So what part of the world are you calling in from? I'm calling in from Chicago, Illinois. So what's your current role at Shared Memory? My current role is the, uh, I'm the, the most senior person and also <laughs> the most junior person <laughs> and also <laughs> the only person. Uh, um, yeah, it's just, as I was telling you before the call, it's just the, the LLC that I had opened up that it just represents me. But uh -huh. it's, it exists for technical reasons. So tell me about your new game that just came out, Animal Well. We've been a lot of excitement um, around it, and I've been excited to see how well it's doing. Um, yeah, it was a project that was about seven years in the making. I started on it in 2017. It was just sort of an after-work sort of hobby project that mm -hmm. has sort of um, just grown into a, a full-fledged like game that just came out a couple right. weeks ago. Yeah, but yeah, so it's like pretty hard to describe, and and that's kind of I sort of started out making it. Not I had like no pitch in mind at all, or I didn't like, you know, have any idea of how it would be marketed, or it wasn't right. Really yeah, about it. it's a two D kind of maybe the closest genre would be like it's like a Metroidvania. <laughs> you uh, you start the game, um, you hatch from this flower. You play as this like little ball character. The game doesn't tell you like anything at all about who you are, where you are, what you're supposed to do. There's like no dialogue. There's no text in the game other than a few like tiny, like one word prompts, like telling you what buttons to press. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, you kind of just emerge into this like lush underground, like cave system. And you just kind of have to wander around and like figure out what's going on. And there's puzzles. It's like puzzles everywhere and mm -hmm. sort of secret passages. And a lot of different like creatures that you'll kind of encounter and you don't really know if they're friendly or if they're sort of hostile. So um, the game is all about like kind of just figuring out for yourself, like what is the, what is even going on and what's it about and yeah, kind of making your own way through it. Um, right. Yeah. And, and I mean, no small feat. You wrote the code, you did the game design, you wrote an engine from scratch, you did sound design. I mean, that's a Renaissance man's level person, right? Like, that's <laughs> amazing, right? Like, to do all those things. And uh, that's you. wild. Yeah. No. What platforms is it on uh, again? It's on, on it's PC. It's on, yeah, PC. That's how I, I started working on it on PC. Right. So it's on Steam. And then I also ported it to the Switch and PlayStation 5. Mm -hmm. So that's where it's at right now. Um, and it's on PlayStation Plus. Okay. If you subscribe to that, you can get it for, for free in quotes. <laughs> and then who is the publisher on this? So I kind of have like almost in a sense like two publishers. So at first, probably about three years ago at this point, I started working with um, my partner, Dan Edelman, who used to be at Xbox and then Nintendo. He's been in the industry for a while. And I've heard that name before. Yeah, I think I know. Yeah, he was like him. sort of the head of indie games at nintendo during like the wii and wii u uh, and then he sort of went indie himself mm -hmm. um maybe like nine years ago and has been since like working on helping do the business and marketing sort of side for um, smaller teams and uh i think one of the first projects he worked on was axiom verge okay. which is another solo developed indie game indie metroidvania um other games were like chasm uh, and so I knew he worked with like solo developers and kind of liked the games I was trying to make. And yeah. so I like, reached out to him probably in 20, 2021. I just like cold emailed him and like, uh, <laughs> hey, dude, what's up? Kind of asked if he wanted to work together because I had no like idea how I was going to like actually ship a game and like get it on consoles and yeah, that business side of it. I'm right. um, actually tell people about it because I was just like, my idea of marketing was like posting on Twitter and getting like five <laughs> likes or something. And, I'll put it on Reddit. That, there you go. Yeah. I'll do, <laughs> doing that like once every two or three months or something. And I'm feeling like terrible about it each time. I'm like, oh, yeah, like, oh, no one, no one never going to, it was such an uphill battle. And yeah, 
So I was just kind of working in obscurity and I got lucky enough that Dan sort of liked the early demo I had sent him and mm-hmm. agreed to sort of um, work on the project. And he had connections at PlayStation and Nintendo and kind of knew who to get in touch with there. And, okay. um, you know, just experience sort of submitting games to cert and applying to shows and uh mm-hmm. getting getting the game like esrb rated or knowing like what localizers that are like good to work with and just right. like all these little things yeah biz um, dev type stuff in some ways yeah right. yeah um so for a while our plan was to like self-publish and we were sort of marketing the game different things we got on like the playstation blog and uh, okay. got a little bit of marketing support from them and then um, I think in summer of 2022, we did uh, Day of the Devs, which was a really mm-hmm. cool event. Um, it happens each year, and it's sort of organized by Double Fine. I am 8-bit. Like, uh, oh, right. Double Fine with Schaefer. And Schaefer, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Schaefer, yeah. Uh, so we got selected to be like shown in their live stream, which like got a lot of attention because it was sort of shown right after summer games fest like jeff Keeley's big oh mm-hmm. presentation so yeah. um, all the people that were watching that like the other devs just sort of started out it was like the after show mm-hmm. and a lot of people just saw it through that and yeah we actually did like a an arg puzzle for that the little video i made for that oh. where we like hit some things on the walls in my office that were tied to like the footage in the game and people needed to like um do this like pick cross puzzle with like the pixel art on one of the screens and there's a bunch of steps and it eventually like led them to a page on my website huh. that told them to like email me this like c- certain passphrase and then i would send them a free link of the game when when the game yeah, came out that's cool. um yeah and it was from that we set up a discord right mm-hmm. before doing that and i had very little experience with discord or like hosting a server but yeah we had like hundreds of people come like flood into it right at that moment that video went live to like try to solve the puzzle and they were just like piranhas like tearing up like <laughs> or something. Like I thought I like put so many steps into it that I'm like, oh this maybe they'll never solve this. No one will know. Like yeah. I, this, but but they figured it out within like two hours. Uh <laughs> they all just like dog piled on it and yeah crowdsource it. Why do you get this? Yeah, it's amazing. You you'll just they'll just start setting up Google Docs and they'll start like all typing in it at the same time. Really? What? Just like all like sort of yeah, sort of crowdsourcing different things to try, and yeah, it's it's super cool. I had never sort of witnessed that before, and I think it's like if you, I could see why there's a lot of people that are sort of on the lookout for any ARG like puzzle. So yeah, if they're doing that, just continued kind of going to shows. Went to Germany for Gamescom. Uh, after that. Got yeah, into yeah. India Arena booth, and that was very that was kind of my first time ever going to Europe, and um, that was. Cool. A big thing, kind of exhausting doing like the long plane ride. And then Gamescom is like 10 hours long each day. And it's like seven days. It's like a giant show and it's like <laughs> very, very tiring. But, but yeah. And then we went to Tokyo Game Show after mm-hmm. that. Oh, and I should back up during the Summer Games Fest thing. Uh, the YouTuber Video Game Donkey made a video sort of covering all the games that were shown during that day. Right. Um, most of them, he was kind of like making fun of like all the AAA games that were being shown. And uh, that summer particularly, it was like, it was all space games. It, it was, it was really like <laughs> kind of exhausting. It was, we had dead space, Starfield, and I forget maybe the Calypso protocol. There was like a few others and, and it was getting right. to, it's like every time they showed another trailer, it would be like, right. And it was like the, the moon in front of the sun and it's like they were and they were like all like most of them were like survival horror games it was like horror games in space it was like <laughs> the only thing you were seeing that somewhere and so oh, it, no. yeah it was just like sometimes triple a can just really look bad and like yeah yeah un- like uninspired so yeah he like made this video just kind of making fun of everything that was shown right but then then someone like in our discord like linked the video is like hey donkey mentioned you in his latest video and at first i'm like oh god what because i know he just like <laughs> right what, you trash me yeah. <laughs> i'm like all right so i'm like bracing myself to watch it <laughs> i go through the whole video and then like towards the end he's like and then the double fine like presentation they actually showed some games that were maybe gonna be good and two of them stuck out and one of them was animal well is like and he said like this actually looks like it might be fun i was like oh wow and just from like that five second mention, we got like a pretty big like wish list bump because he uh, has like that's key. He has right. like 
seven or eight million subscribers on YouTube. So he's like consistently makes videos that um, are on like the front page of YouTube and like mm -hmm. um, are trending in like the game <laughs> game category and right has just like a gigantic like loving dedicated fan base. So. So yeah, I was like just excited by that and then kind of didn't make much else of it. Mm. And then, yeah, when we were in Japan, maybe like three months later, um, his wife, Leah, who's also makes YouTube videos, started talking to Dan on Twitter because we like were posting some pictures at the time of, of Animal Well. And then it was at that point we like kind of found out that, that they're like going to announce a publisher soon in the like coming month or so and they haven't told anyone about it but that they were like fans of of animal well and um mm -hmm. they were wondering if we wanted to talk about it and we're like i i guess why not like because we were planning right. on self-publishing and we were you know, like getting some traction with right. the events we were going to but i was like in the wish list and stuff yeah yeah so it was like it was like looking all right it was nothing like crazy but it was like i think this game will be profitable and i can finish it and people will like it um yeah but um but we're like, but this potentially like could be a huge <laughs> game changing thing if we were yeah. like the first game to be published. And uh, so I, I was a little worried that they would be like overly demanding about like, you know, changes to the game design or want to like kind of. Right, right. And I didn't really know what kind of people they were like, like off camera. Um, yeah. But it turns out it was just they're very sweet and like kind of friendly. And you could tell they just like really love video games and um they yeah, trusted your vision right like yeah yeah, yeah. we're trying to micromanage you like ah, we need some blood in this and can you put more text and you, <laughs> you know that kind of shit yeah no it was just like uh you could tell that you know they sort of had found success making like a youtube videos and being commentators on about the game industry and now they just like kind of wanted to get more involved and sort of actually have some stake in, in a project so yeah it was like wasn't really going to be an issue i would like maintain creative control and they would just kind of give feedback and help market the game and uh yeah it was just like kind of a win-win so so yeah we um decided to start working with them as well so it still had all of, like dan's expertise and then we had this like new like flashy publisher that was getting a lot of sort of news and people were very curious like what their games would be mm -hmm. um the first youtube video they had, uh donkey made a sort of announcing the publisher it was like it drew a lot of like uh some like criticism where people were kind of skeptical that um that like they that I, someone who just made youtube videos could also be like knew how to publish games so there's almost a lot of like gatekeeping and like uh, right um like naysaying about it so either way it was like we both had like a lot to prove with how the game would turn out and mm -hmm. It was just getting a lot of attention at that point. And then, yeah, fast forward, I think, to January 2023, we announced that we were, like, working together, and we got, like, over, like, 100,000 wish lists, like, within, like, a day. Wow. 100,000? Uh, Damn, dude. Yeah. So it was just crazy. But all our efforts up into that point, going to all these shows and traveling around the world and doing these, you know, presentations, we probably had gotten, like, 40,000 accumulated. Mm -hmm. And so it just, like more than tripled it right just like, like an instant <laughs> just like you look at our like our like wish list chart on steam right. it just looks like a, a vertical wall or just like the old hockey stick is the uh, exactly it is say. the hockey wow. stick shape and i was like oh my god that that was like life-changing and so wow. then it's just been like a ton of press and stuff like looking forward to the game coming out and we started doing bigger booths at PAX we did PAX East and PAX West and mm -hmm. um, we had sort of lines like wrapping around the booth at one point the fire marshal was like getting upset <laughs> our line was like wrapping around the other booths and like causing like a fire hazard <laughs> <laughs> you're blocking this hydrant over here the, the, the fire extinguisher <laughs> yeah <laughs> think of um, jim carrey from uh living color at the fire marshal bob or whatever like get, get out of here <laughs> yeah it was, it was like that but real <laughs> that's um, funny so just like yeah lots of things i never would have expected to actually happen to me have been happening with this project and since then the past year i've always just like in self-imposed crunch and kind of not talking to anyone because i at that point it stopped worrying about the marketing of the game i'm like i know people will play this and check it out i just right. need to make sure it's good I'm like i just right. need to finish right. it um and you know it had taken like six years at that point and it was still right. like, wasn't 
done. So I was like, all right, I just, if I do one thing in my life now, it's finish this project. And I, I just recently did that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it had to be refreshing to know, like, at least you didn't have to worry about that side of the coin, right? Like, all right, mm-hmm. it's got buzz, it's got marketing. I'm not going to make this game and it gets uh, a thousand downloads and it's all for naught, right? Like, like yeah. that's figured out. So um, it had to put pressure on you, but at the same time, it had to be uh, relieving just to know, like, now my focus is just mi- to make the best damn game, you know, I can and just focus on that. When did you leave Level X? Because um, I can't remember, was it a year or two ago? Two years ago? Yeah, it was about, um, I think it was right at the start of 2022. I think my last day was like... Okay. December 31st, 2021. So, okay. Part of the year. Yeah. So that allowed you then just to like hyper focus and not, you know, have a day job and then try and do this for hours on the side at night. Yeah. My, my, my development process before then was like, I would get up a little early and then I would probably work on it for like two hours before work each day. And Mm -hmm. it was like, if I got like one feature done or if I fixed a few bugs, that was like each day, that was kind of like what I was happy. And then I would, you know, right. work a day at level X and then occasionally like after work, I would, you know, maybe go back and work on it some more if I had an evening free or, and then usually every weekend I would find a, take a day and work on it the whole day. But right. Yeah. So it was like, it was very liberating to then like, like, okay, well, like now this project is my full-time job. I don't need to, <laughs> right. I don't need to like work two jobs in a sense. Uh, but I was happy that I did, you know, kind of work on the game probably for like four years while like having the stability of, of level X because mm-hmm. it's so hard to like uh to finish games. So it's like you have to in order yeah. to like figure out what it is, you need I think you need that sort yeah. of comfort and peace mm-hmm. of mind that you're not burning through your savings while trying to test yeah. out your ideas. Yeah, yeah, that added pressure and uh yeah, because it's so easy to get the the plane in the air, right? Like, mm-hmm. yeah, I got this game, I'm developing you know it's land the f and playing that that's the bear yeah. right like who can do that because yeah i mean you were at level x you were at nether realm working in mortal combat mm-hmm. right and then phosphorus so you were at three games studios right am i missing any um yeah no, those are those are the main ones yeah yeah no you did great work at level x between our our phlegm tech or booger tech whatever that was <laughs> yeah we did for Palmex and then all the wild stuff with cardio x and all the explosions and yeah so that's a hell of a journey, right? How did you get started? Uh, so I went and I did my undergrad in film and video at uh, Columbia College here okay. in Chicago. Mm-hmm. And my initial plan was to like go into the film industry and either be like, I kind of bounced around with different ideas, wanting to either direct or do cinematography or video editing or mm-hmm. animation or uh, I don't know. Um, so I just like tried a lot of, a lot of different stuff during my undergrad and kind of just realized by the time I was graduating that I just like, I don't, my heart wasn't really in it. And, you know, I had a lot of friends and, you know, like colleagues that you could tell they just, they loved art or they loved film and that to, mm-hmm. to a point where like they're, you know, thought about it constantly. And then it was like, you know, there's like their dream to do that stuff. And yeah. I think for me, it was like, maybe a more minor hobby, but I, I enjoyed like doing video stuff in high school. So that's kind of what led me into it. But mm-hmm. I found myself like just thinking much more about like video games and computers during that time. And it was during like maybe my, my senior year of college, I taught myself to program as just like something on the side. And mm-hmm. uh, I kind of discovered, I just loved that way, way more. And it was kind of effortless. Like mm-hmm. I would have like assignments for like a uh, film classes I was taking and, and I would like tend to like procrastinate and just not really be, it, maybe it was Into fun it. once I got started, but uh, yeah. I kind of had to like push myself to, to get things done. But yeah, when it came to programming, it was just like kind of effortless. And I found that I could kind of just do it for like the entire day. It, it felt <laughs> like it was like playing a video game or something where it's just like really, really fun. And uh, yeah, there's this cool thing where um, when you code something like the computer just like shows you the results and you can like make minor tweaks and get like, you know, a wildly different output. So it, mm-hmm. your like iteration loop of a work you do is like really rapid and compared to if you're just like trying to shoot a short film, you got to like schedule things and like oh, get right, people yeah. to act in it and uh, write a script. And it just takes like, you know, months and months before like any of your efforts like result in something that you can like look at and and be proud of but yeah i found yeah programming to be like 
very like instantaneous and I mm-hmm. kind of stumbled into uh, making video games like while programming. I was using this language called processing, which is the first thing I like started with. And it was sort of mm. designed for like artists to do like creative code things. And it has a lot of built in functions for like just drawing geometry and colors and fonts and, uh, you know, like messing with your webcam. So it's like for with like very little code, you can make like something that's like very visually impressive and kind of fun. And mm-hmm. um and so that, that's kind of like how I got started. And I made, started making like little games in that. Um, I made like kind of like a Space Invaders like clone and uh, just tried a lot of different things. And um, yep. And then, yeah, I, I realized like, OK, I think I this is what I want to do. I should go back to school. So I actually went to Paul also in Chicago offers a kind of an accelerated like master's degree you can do in either their game development or computer mm-hmm. science program so i was able to sort of like even though i didn't have a computer science undergrad degree i was able to sort of take a few prereq classes and sort of to get a master's degree in computer science and then hmm. while doing that like sort of focus on a lot of game development stuff right um and then yeah ever since then it's been like kind of full speed ahead and i got a internship through like the depaul like newsletter at this school in chicago called chicago quest they're like a charter school and Hmm. their sort of gimmick was that they used like game design throughout the whole like curriculum for it was like a middle school like sixth through eighth grade i think oh for teaching for for, like for yeah yeah so they designed games for like the students to like teach them the material so there's a lot of like Hmm. board games or sometimes it was actually there was a f- relatively few video games, but the ones they did have, I was actually the one that like had to make them. I was an intern there and yeah, they kind of just like sat me in a room with my MacBook and like unity and flash. And then just, I made a few small uh, little like mini games for them to like teach them like how polynomials work. Or um, there was one about like the Pythagorean theorem and I made all these little like math games. And, mm-hmm. and then, That's so cool. I did that. And once that like school year ended, I actually got a, Again, through like the DePaul newsletter, they told me I learned about like an internship at Phosphor Games. Um, mm. And then I went there and applied and I kind of showed off some little mini like indie projects I was working on. And I think that helped me get an internship there. I had done the DePaul like uh, Indie City Games meetup like maybe right. a few weeks before that. And I showed this little XNA game I was making at the time where you like uh it was like a local co-op like twin stick shooter thing where you like paint a canvas together but it's also okay. like shooting at each other um it was very like abstract um and i think ryan Weemeyer saw it there yeah uh, ryan Weemeyer. then yeah. like told people at phosphor about it so they i feel like because i'd done that they're like oh we we know he's making a game and um mm-hmm. i think that's how i got like an internship phosphor and then yeah since then i was there for like two or three years and then we worked mm-hmm. together you yeah we worked together there on a, was it w- yeah wwe immortals right so. yeah wwe immortals that was kind of like my for like my first real job in the industry where i'm like oh this is a real game studio yeah and kind of learned how to work on a team and learned how to use like perforce and version control right. with, like all of the ways i should structure my code so like people other people can read it and understand it and uh i think it's it's very different from working solo versus right actually working on a team and that was like super valuable to kind of have that experience yeah and so depaul was it through keenan did you work with ed keenan yeah i did yeah. i took a lot of his uh game engine classes um okay and yeah, he was amazing. He was like a great teacher. I think he was kind of like a little bit of a hard ass. And yeah. I think some students either like hated him or they loved him. It was like, mm-hmm. like, kind of expected, yeah. yeah, expected a lot out of people. But yeah, I feel like that's probably his classes are why I've like been so interested in like, you know, optimization and like lower level programming and why I've like chosen to make my own engine for my game. And yeah, uh, it's always just been like had an interest in it ever since then. Yeah, he and I worked together at Midway a long time ago, and he was heading up a team building an internal Midway engine, right? So mm-hmm. and this was like 2001, something like that, 2002. Oh, actually before that, maybe 2000. Yeah, I started there in 2000. Yeah, that makes sense. I've hired a bunch of computer science people out of DePaul, and all of them have been amazing. Um, so yeah. it's always a good sign when... They go through Keenan's curriculum and they're at DePaul in terms of uh, turning out to be great engineers. So that's cool. 
Yeah, no, I'm still like very happy I went there. I'm I I feel like if I didn't get that degree at DePaul and didn't have those like people that worked in the industry sort of like mentoring me, it, it would have been very hard to like learn on my own because mm. I think for like an indie dev like starting out, there's a ton of like YouTube tutorials and stuff, and right. I would say five percent of them are just terrible, and they're like it's kind <laughs> of like the blind leading the, the blind. blind. Or, yeah. Right. So it's like the people that actually know what they're doing, like aren't making YouTube videos. They're like right. at companies, uh, at companies or, or universities or yeah. universities. Yeah. It's, it's very easy to get like beginner level knowledge. And then it's also mm-hmm. like somewhat easy to get like PhD level research paper knowledge, but there's like nothing oh. in between. It's like you can either read like the academic papers or you can like watch this like really junior YouTube video. Um, right. And if you want to like, Across that gap, it's really yep. hard. And yeah, because I, I think a lot of YouTube videos and people that don't have some of the formal background, they know how to poke a game engine and get stuff to happen, mm-hmm. but but they don't know what's going on underneath that. So then when there's bugs and problems and stuff, it's like whack-a-mole because they're just like, I don't know. And they're like, fix this. And you make two bugs over here and you fix <laughs> that. And you make two. Yeah, you know, I've worked with engineers like that because they had just enough knowledge to be dangerous because they could poke the unity or, you know, and then mm-hmm. it was like, oh, this game's never going to ship because they just don't know what's going on at a deeper level. And they don't have those computer science foundation with the math and stuff. And then, you know, sometimes yeah. you get away with it, but other times, man, what a nightmare. Yeah. And I think with like YouTube specifically, they're actually kind of incentivized to stick with like the really entry level, like content, because like, Huge, it's like a much show, bigger right? much bigger yeah audience of people that are just getting started or curious so it's like uh mm-hmm. i remember there is one pretty good youtube series called uh handmade hero i um hmm. I'll put I, that I used to work at red games okay but he's he was sort of set out and he had been in the industry for a long time like decades and set out to sort of make a game with a game engine like completely from scratch uh hmm all like streamed online and he he started in like 2015 i want to say okay Um, and you could just tell like the first few episodes where he's like starting and like introducing the the series have like you know probably like hundreds of thousands of views or something yeah and then every episode it like goes down like you know like that's like goes down by like 25 percent until like you get into like a hundred episodes in, it's like, okay, almost nobody is watching this. (laughs) Like, God, it's probably like so demotivating to to like sort of keep that up when it's like, yeah, once no one's able to sort of follow along at that point. Well, because yeah, the few that are following along are serious and everyone else are kind of posers, right? Like they're just like, Oh yeah, I'll do this. Ah, this is hard. And and, you know, they don't stick with it because, but yeah, that funnel starts wide and just goes, you know, (laughs) yeah. Um, just thinking back, like, what do you wish you had known when you'd started on this journey of making games, working for game companies, doing your own solo project? Yeah, it's, it's hard to know. Cause like, I don't know. I feel like I've ended up in sort of the, the dream scenario, right? <laughs> I always wanted to be. So like, I feel like the path I took led, has led me here and I'm very grateful to be here. So I don't know. I, I really value both like kind of all the things that I ended I did during the course of my life like uh yeah having going doing like going to film school was like maybe i part of me says like oh well you should have known like it would have been nice to know early on that like you wanted to make games and i should have just gone straight into that but i think i don't know probably that that also gave me like that helped me like build my my art skills a little bit and right. uh, sort of develop Your visual my, stuff my visual yeah. tastes um right. which is pretty important when and is like I think helped me stand out amongst like other engineers. I, Cause I think the cliche is just like a lot of engineers have just terrible taste. <laughs> like, right. Programmer just, art, right. It was always, yeah. that's always the joke. Like, yeah, yeah. Well, just put some box in there as programmer. Art. We'll make it look better later. Like you're zero and ones person. You can't do art. Like what are you yeah, talking yeah. about? Yeah. Like there, I, I know a lot, I've seen a lot of like really technically impressive projects that just like look like garbage because they don't, focus on the art at all so it's like yeah there's a really cool like algorithm driving this or something but it's like primary color is like (laughs) hot red and blue (laughs) right (laughs) yeah uh, uh, you got some like model that you found on like turbo squid uh (laughs) exactly turbo squid but 
But yeah, I think I, I thought it was like really important, I think, to work at game studios and kind of like get like it took a long time, I think, to develop the technical skills to really like confidently start out on an indie project. Because when I was right. um, before even Phosphor, when I was in school, I, I was trying to make indie games. I was like, I was sort of always in the back of my head of like the thing I wanted to do. So this was probably back in, you know, twenty. 2012 or something like 12 years ago at this point i was like i like i want to make a game by myself i think i had recently watched like indie game the movie okay. and was like very inspired by that and yeah um, and so i there was a few games i tried to make and i just didn't finish them they like either got too complicated or i got kind of distracted and sort of lost motivation so it, right. uh, and I, I did that a few times and because you know it's kind of discouraging when you keep starting all these small projects and then they don't they kind of just die um yeah and i think part of it were was like i don't know i just i I didn't know what it meant to like finish a game or i didn't know what it meant to like release a game and also i probably just didn't have the technical ability to like structure a Mm -hmm. large project and yeah you know it's easy to make a like an arcade style game with like a few levels or something where you just like you know you just spawn waves of enemies and like um you just Mm -hmm go for a high score or something but uh right actually build a world and have like you know goals and puzzles and uh for it to like be stable and like yeah. uh, run efficiently and you know just meet all these different requirements that i think took working at like phosphor and and seeing us like you know ship games and uh kind of knowing what the qa process was like and kind of this just learning like all the little things that need to be done for yeah. to call something complete um and so, yeah, I think that was like necessary um, mm-hmm. before like starting to do that on my on my own. Um, and then I learned about a whole bunch of stuff that I think like you and other people were doing that like as an engineer, I had like no insight into about like, yeah, like the, you know, the biz dev stuff or submitting builds, uh, going through CERT and, you know, localization and yeah. ESRP ratings, just like all these, all this like sort of all these administrative tasks that yeah uh, all the behind the scenes I, stuff I mean, that is needed right yeah it's not just like work make make the game <laughs> it's like right. make the game but then like all this ancillary shit that's around yeah, the game so outside much, of so it. many people you need to talk to and coordinate with to to get the game up on the storefront and let you know let people know it's a real thing but yeah and then you know certification and doing submissions and you know points and uh yeah this, I, i've got s- stories yeah. from all that you know and some councils are easier about it other ones are just mm-hmm. hammer you you know and there's that whole range of of that so yeah all that business stuff right yeah um, yeah i think we failed cert on playstation a couple times because uh wasn't using the right terminology for controller vibrations i think i put in the <laughs> options that it says like haptic feedback right and they're like no it has to be called vibrations <laughs> like <laughs> Uh, and then, so then I like changed it and then, and then it failed again because it wasn't using their correct terminology in like all the other languages. They're like, no, you have to go through this big like spreadsheet of like, there's an uh, approval word in every language ever mm-hmm. that we have approved. <laughs> it needs to be that. It's gotta be exactly like, that. Yeah. Yeah. And there's all these like weird requirements. Like you pull the controller out and you put it back in. There's a certain amount mm-hmm. of time that it has to recover. And then, uh, yeah. yeah, there's so much of that just kind of like oh annoying stuff uh, yeah and it takes do. like weeks of time like every time one of those like issues comes up it's like all right now you got to get back in the queue and right. like, reapply yeah. and you're like, oh my god i'm gonna we're gonna miss our like our release date <laughs> because right. because of this and that's happening to everybody and then the big publishers have connections and they're getting on the horn like yo push this game up front you know they're trying to leverage it like you know so there's all of that going on too and if you're an indie you're just out out kind of in the wild and these big publishers are probably cutting in front of you um there's a funny story back at midway we were doing one of the mk's mortal Kombat's on ps2 for europe back when sony forced you to put them on these special discs and you had to Mm. ship them to sony london and they had to be on these discs and we kept missing and bugs and issues and it got down to like we don't have enough time to even fedex so like we were putting people on planes with the discs to, <laughs> to go to London. Yeah, oh my God, yeah. And then it would be like someone on the flight, and then also like two hours later, it would be like, oh, no, we, 
no, we got to fix this. We got to fix this. And then we would burn more discs and you had a special machine to burn it. And then we were calling someone, Leanne, or somebody was on a flight and we're like, abort, abort, abort. Don't take those discs to Sony. There's a person on another airplane behind you from Chicago to London with the discs to get it to Sony in time. And just that level of submission craziness back when it had to be on on medium. Yeah, I'm I'm very grateful that I didn't didn't have to do a physical version at launch we're, we're doing one this year though we're trying to cool. go live for it tomorrow through limited run games since launch i've had an opportunity to sort of fix some bugs and some things have come up so yeah so the version that will be on the disc will be like the fully you know patched good like archive copy that i'll cool. be confident at that point that you know it's it's good to go it's been no, it's, it's, so it'll be on ps5 discs you're saying yeah, it'll be on PS5 discs and then Nintendo Switch as well. Okay. And we're doing kind of like a fancy collector's edition, too. Yeah, I was going to say, you got to do some like yeah. higher end with box art or... Yeah, you know, no. We're do- so you can get the basic one if you want, but then there's, there's going to be a collector's edition that comes with uh, this kind of cool little notebook and a pen to sort of take notes because there's a lot of puzzles. Oh, yeah, I've heard there's tons of I, puzzles. Yeah. That might benefit from, you know, taking some notes or drawing some diagrams. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, for those people they'll have a little special one-of-a-kind notebook and then yeah there's going to be like a map of the game oh uh, this kind of cool little acrylic scene of one of the areas that you can explore it'd be a nice little package and it comes in this like very kind of sleek minimalist black box uh, Mm -hmm. with a rabbit logo on it Um, cool this episode will come out in a couple weeks but will it be on the store where you can order it i'll have to put it in the show notes so um, yeah, so I think the pre-order window is going to be for a month, so okay. um, it'll probably be, yeah, still still going on. Cool. Yeah, I'll put that in the show notes. Um, awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. No, that's cool. Okay, so like, what about someone now working at a game studio who wants to, you know, I, I even know what to call you, because it's like, you advance mm-hmm. your career as an engineer or a designer, or like, you, you know, yeah. like, what kind of thoughts do you have, or, or who wants to part two of that just i'll branch off like just wants to do their own thing like what kind of advice to go indie maybe that's more appropriate Um, yeah i think uh when working working at studios like i feel like my attitude was always just like do the things that people like didn't want to do or do the things that people thought were hard and just like embrace that and like always try to find the way where you can like learn and grow the most like out of like from the job you're doing right so like yeah when i i started at netherrealm i remember so at phosphor i was doing a lot of like ui programming i kind of like became my my niche because i i knew flash and there was a lot of like scale form stuff we were doing and scale form yeah yeah. yeah. Uh, so i got like kind of good at that but then when i switched and went over the netherrealm i remember a rod who was the lead yeah engineer at the time i know you're right like, good okay well you, you can do a few different things you can either do like ui programming also we need like a, a network engineer so whatever sounds like more interesting to you and like i knew nothing about um sort of network backend stuff so oh, right. i was like i could do ui programming i could continue to do that and it would be comfortable but um instead i decided just to do the thing i knew less about um mm-hmm. i feel like like I was able to, it was, it stayed interesting. I was like uncomfortable for maybe a few months where I felt like a little bit of imposter syndrome. Like, I don't, right. I, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how this I'm works and uh, yeah. you're going to, they're asking me questions that I don't have the answers to, but it was very like that motivated me to, I think, learn and grow a lot. And right then yeah level x i did a lot of work with like sort of shaders and graphics effects and learned a lot of new stuff there as well and was always just you know i guess eager to do the thing that people maybe were intimidated by and it Mm -hmm. would i I was maybe intimidated by too but i think just uh i don't know you have to be brave (laughs) yeah you have to stretch yourself right because otherwise it would get boring if you get if if you're the ui programmer the rest of your life right that'd be kind of yeah and yeah i think just like just try to always like look for opportunities to grow i would also like i think being able to distinguish between like uh like fundamental knowledge and then like knowledge that's more like situational and and try to like prioritize more fundamental stuff so if uh, having the opportunity to like learn how like linux works is more valuable to me than like learning about a new feature that unity just released uh 
or wow. like a new package, like or a new some new like you know trendy software because like right. that will be like relevant for you know maybe a year or something, but then it's going to become obsolete and you never really learned anything deep about it. You just like right. you learned how it works, and then when the next thing comes out, like all that knowledge is like useless. So yeah, it's like yeah. so I've always been more interested in like lower level stuff i want to learn how like the tools are built and like how the computer fundamentally like works underneath uh mm-hmm. all the software that we use on top of it so i think the more like deep fundamental knowledge you can learn like versus yep. the just like the throwaway stuff yeah, like yeah. The, the healthier yeah. you'll, you'll be yeah. in the long run yeah no that makes a lot of sense and and i should bring it up just like i mean you built your own engine right like mm-hmm. was it in c sharp or, or like or what did uh, you c c plus plus c plus plus okay so object oriented and you built an engine from scratch to do, you know because it's 2d right so you're not dealing with the z plane but still like that's very ambitious to be able to build that from scratch i mean like yeah since since like college i had like a little toy game engine that i would like kind of learn how to do things in it was like a little sort of sandbox yeah I would just figure out how do you make like an audio system or how would a memory manager work if you wanted to write one. And so this, uh, was, this was like a way to like sort of test out and learn all that, all those things. And mm-hmm. so I had made actually like a 3D game engine that was kind of like just imagine like a really janky, bad version of Unity or something where there's like a 3D <laughs> scene editor. And, you know, it is you can import 3D models and um, apply materials and edit properties and stuff on things and Mm -hmm. uh, save and load scenes to uh, like a serialized format. And, Mm -hmm. um, and so I spent like, honestly, probably this was when I was like at phosphor and another realm, I spent years like kind of just working on this 3d game engine and occasionally tried to like make games with it, but it was just too, like too kind of bloated and unwieldy to um, actually do anything with. And yeah, it was sort of, doing trying to make something more complicated like i I like learned a lot of lessons and i was like okay i should if i'm going to actually release a game i need to sort of stick with the things i am confident i can do so like Mm -hmm. 2d i I can draw 2d art i don't know 3d modeling that much um i'll do pixel art because like it will limit the scope of like the art assets i need to make and Hey, if you're finding this interesting, please click the like and subscribe button so the YouTube algorithms know and I can help spread the show. Thanks. I wanted to spend most of my time programming, not necessarily just like crafting elaborate art assets. Oh, right. Yeah. And and so, yeah, I sort of set a lot of restrictions for myself early on making this game engine. And then that's, I think, the only way I was able to like kind of actually truly make progress. Yeah. No, that makes sense. So, like, you were building the engine and the game started building on top of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it wasn't like in parallel. It was, it was kind of like built, get the engine going and then start building the game on top of it when you did your stripped down engine. Right? Yeah, actually, I would say more like my approach was more like I'm going to try to make a game without a game engine. So it's like I'll just pretend like Windows, <laughs> like the Windows <laughs> API is my is my game engine and like let me see all the things that could do it's like well it can like it can open a window and i could uh yeah, then if i if i want to draw sh- things on the screen then i need to like oh i need to use direct x and like okay now i need uh, to know what right. direct x is and then mm-hmm. okay this lets me draw like triangles and uh <laughs> if i draw two triangles together i can make a, a square and then if i texture the square i can draw a sprite <laughs> um right then i give it like and then if i you know, I can set up all this stuff. So now I can make like a, like a 2d game and yeah, uh, our building levels made up of tiles. And uh, yeah, I had to be very realistic about like what I could actually get done. I tried to just keep the scope as low as possible. So yeah, I didn't really make the engine first. It was more like I okay. made it, I made the parts of, the, cause that, that was the problem I think of before where I was just making an engine without a game. So it's just like, I'm going to just speculate about what I will need oh, and try to oh, just make stuff and I'll try to have, and then I'll start game development and I'll just have my big pile of tools that mm-hmm. I'll reach into and everything will <laughs> it'll be so easy, but, but that you don't, you can't really predict the needs of a project when you haven't like designed it or started right. working on it. So it was kind of slow at first, but. I just made only the tech that I needed as as I came up with a, a literal game idea or like mm-hmm. game mechanic. So 
I would say the first few years were kind of slow. There's a lot of going bouncing back and forth between like low level like engine work and then like game design. Um, yeah. But over time, I started like you know accumulating systems that made sense for my game and the the ratio of time between like engine work and game work started shifting from like 100 percent engine work to like it was almost there's like a they swapped places okay the end it's like okay i have i'm just doing like level design now in a mm. in a set of tools that make only this game towards the end i was like very happy that uh with the tools i had accumulated and um mm. like sort of the the workflow it ended up being like very fast and i think having a custom engine that's made just for one game is you can actually work a lot faster than in like unity or unreal because like there's nothing distracting you and it's just like i don't know it just does one thing really well and <laughs> yeah it's hyper focused around that yeah it's very very just satisfying to use and i feel mm-hmm. very proud but that's really yeah. cool yeah i think yeah working at the other studios and i think it's just yeah i think if it were, if I had done this like 10 years before, I, it would have blown up <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. A, a pile of tech debt. But I think just like, yeah, having experience already working on larger projects, kind of, I had some clues about how, how things should be structured. Already. Structured, yeah. W- would you recommend this to other people? Like build their own engine? Um, I think like, so. It sounds like I, you enjoyed it. Yeah. I, if you, if you're at all like interested in how computers work and you like, you're like detail oriented and, and you want to make something that is like tightly crafted and and you just enjoy the act of programming i think uh yeah i would recommend it for sure i think my main priority with this project was like just to keep it fun for myself early on it felt actually kind of self-indulgent to like make my own engine when there was like you know i could just i probably would have made way more progress using unity early on during like the first year or something right i had something to show very quickly but instead like i had this like very basic 2d pixel art tile editor i was like it looked like an nes game i was making (laughs) felt like (laughs) like really kind of dinky and and basic but um but i was like laying the foundation for for it to grow and become more elaborate so um yeah I i don't think there's like enough people doing engine development anymore a lot of mm-hmm. there's a lot of, there's like way more game developers now and there's a lot of them are using unity or unreal or good um which is right traction but and i i think you can kind of tell like it does influence your thinking and the design of the game so i think in the way like limitations breed creativity i think yeah designing your own tools will kind of lead you in different design directions for the project overall mm-hmm. you'll approach problems in a different way because you have a different tool set than everyone else right i think it's like yeah you'll just probably end up making something more unique whether you realize it or not because you just have a different workflow yeah because you're not like i'm going to do this thing and i'm going to go on the forums and message boards and somebody else already solved that so you're going that way you're you know that's that's interesting because i i always again it's the producer brain to me when people mm-hmm. are like i'm right my old engine i'm like what are you insane there's like <laughs> unity like it's free yeah. but you know what i mean like so i didn't understand that concept it just seemed so foreign to me having come from a time when you had you mm-hmm. make your own engines and it, it was so painful that when there were engines that came out and made it more turnkey it was such a relief that it seemed like you would, no one would ever go back to that. But yeah, with your perspective and your explanation, that makes more sense. And that is interesting. It's like, oh, okay, this this isn't crazy talk. This makes more sense to me now. Yeah, I think it's like there there are definitely like pros and cons. And I think for you know, you can still put the work in to make something good in an off the shelf engine, but. Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to be very tempting to just use the out of the box features in like a low effort way. Like you can, right. You can tell when a game is made in unreal because it comes with like a character controller script that like has the same like jump physics and like movement (laughs) speed. And like, um, you know, it was like, why wouldn't you just use that? They give it to you and it's like tested and, and like works pretty well. Um, but you're then gonna, yeah, it's going to keep you from like, um, really exploring the other possibilities so but mm-hmm. um and same with yeah I, 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 games that just end up feeling the same and, and, right. and there's just more games than ever now so i think it's like you almost need to go against the grain to, to mm-hmm. stand out yeah it, it kind of what you did too because like th- there's a lot of the metroid castlevania 2d platformers out there right but mm-hmm. like you, you added the depth with the puzzles and you kind of i think i read something about you were saying it's kind of like three levels 
uh, or three games in a game, which makes it stand out, right? Because like I, I just see those w- w- when I'm on Steam, and I'm like, oh, another one of those, another one of those. But like you figured mm-hmm. out a way to go deeper, make a different twist on it, and that rises above all the kind of other ones that are out there. Um, yeah, it just isn't like a Me Too game, right? Like, is this, there's just another one? There's another one. There's another one. Yeah, I think it's just it's it it is it's very competitive, and I. I think yeah to make anything that I honestly think is worth people's time it, it it did take yeah it took like 7 years to do because that's another thing I think I'm conscious of is like you have to seriously ask like yourself like is this worth people's time like compared to all the other things oh, they could be doing like right. you know like 14,000 games came out on Steam like last year in the past year and they could be playing like any of them like right. someone could just go play like you know, Hollow Knight again or whatever. You're like, yeah, yeah. you're competing with like all these classic games that have come out. You're competing with like people's friends and family. They're, um, mm. you know, every great book and movie that was ever made. Like right. that they Netflix, was, like, YouTube. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, do you want to like, are you making someone's life better? Are you making them a better person by like asking them to play this thing? So right. like, I feel like there's like a lot of responsibility. And if you're like a, game developer or any kind of like creator um Mm -hmm. that you need to like i don't know i just just put put time in uh and not waste people's time (laughs) Um, yeah yeah no you're you're being uh conscious of other people's time right because you you don't want the person to be like 20 minutes in like why the fuck am i playing this like this is you know i'm like this is a waste of my time right so like in the back of your mind like oh i don't want the game to be like that for these people right like i I want to make something that they can really sink their teeth into and yeah i think there's like there's a lot of trends in the industry well i think with like things like you know software as a service and like yeah pass and stuff game developers are like very incentivized to make things that are just kind of time sinks or are more like addictive and right it's yeah. it's more appealing for like a publisher that a game like can be played like indefinitely like for you know hundreds or thousands of hours and you know there is no end to it and it, you, they just want every game wants to be like Fortnite now where it's just like your right. uh, your go-to like hobby and yeah or grand theft auto yeah. right i mean yeah grand, grand theft, theft auto online God. like the just, the top just keeps printing money right that game the just... top 10 games that are like in terms of like playtime are all like old games at this yeah. point there's like right. <laughs> There's like Minecraft, you know, Grand Theft Auto, Fortnite. Roblox. It's just people are playing the same thing like mm-hmm. indefinitely. And they're they're being deprived of all these like unique bespoke experiences that they probably get a lot more out of. And maybe it's only like, you know, a few hours long. There's like so many great indie games that I think right. you can go through that will like give you great ideas and like be inspiring. And um mm-hmm. but instead they're just like kind of stuck on a treadmill of like just playing right. the same over and over right. because like you know there's like loot boxes and uh yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. it's like fomo from missing like the season pass events and there's right. like all these like psychological like sort of dark design things that are happening right in a lot of these games but it works and they make a lot of money so right I don't know. yeah there's there's armies of product managers and spreadsheets figuring this shit out and yeah. pushing people's buttons and pop-ups and and yeah you know too they, they've probably been burned before with playing some other game and they're half hour in like why am i playing this i just play fortnite mm-hmm. right so they're kind of risk averse and they're like yeah you know it's, it's like, like comfort. it's like comfort food right like oh boy mm-hmm. i could get me some mashed potatoes again tonight because i had mashed <laughs> potatoes last night like why do you keep yeah. eating mashed potatoes well it makes me feel good and it's comforting but <laughs> yeah you know it, it's hard to get out of that box especially if they've been burned a few times so sure yeah that's but the fact that you take it seriously and you're cognizant of those people's time and maybe this opens up the world to other people like damn, that was amazing. Like I should look on Steam for some other games that are, you know, indie games that are out there and not just always keep going back to the same well all the time, playing the same Yeah, games. and so, like I'm guilty of it too, for sure, in like different parts of my life. Like a lot of times, a lot of evenings, it'll, it's, it's like very easy just like watch a bunch of like kind of crappy YouTube videos that are like, <laughs> like clickbait thumbnails that yeah. I'll just like, and they're each like, you know, 15 minutes long and I'll watch like, six of those or something and yeah and then the the whole like night goes by and it's like fuck i didn't like <laughs> I, don't, I don't feel good about that i'm like i could have watched a movie at least <laughs> that, like you know we think like <laughs> that like had a point to, or something to say <laughs> yeah <laughs> like had a budget <laughs> yeah they all have the same graphics too you, you know it's always like the exaggerated face and like yeah oh! <laughs> 
you got to see this. Oh, yeah. OMG. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah, a whole other uh, just like terrible ecosystem that I know. Uh, <laughs> with, like bad behavior. Now this is on YouTube. I'm like, oh, what kind of graphic am I supposed to do? And I, I look at all these <laughs> yeah. and I'm like, oh, God, those are so cringy. I'm like, I, I know. I don't know. I can't. But then yeah. if you want to make something like elegant, you're going to like be punished. Yeah. You're just going to like point. swipe by it. Like <laughs> what's the shocking thing with the person going. Uh, yeah. yeah. You got to tell you how you're going to feel when you watch it. You're going to, you're going to be shocked. <laughs> it's you're so, it's good. so like condescending. <laughs> <laughs> it's so stupid. <laughs> like you're, you're like a laugh track in a sitcom or something where it's like, now is the point where you laugh. Right, right. Oh, it was Mr. Roper. He did the look at the camera. All right. Cue yeah. up laughter. Three's, yeah. Here we go. Three's company again. Uh, yeah, no, it, it's so weird. Yeah. It, this is a weird world we're in. Yeah. You know, what's your advice around developing interpersonal skills, EQ, core skills, like being able mm. to communicate with folks, you know, what kind of ideas do you have around that? Yeah, I think um, that's something like, yeah, I've, I've had to learn over my career. And I think as an engineer, uh, there's like a lot of cliches about sort of the, the like lone wolf, like sort of a right. genius or something. Right, like right. Mr. Robot or, <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> like, yeah, just sitting in the corner with uh, the headphones like, go away, get, leave me alone, leave me alone. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and if you're like a young person, like in school or something, and you're like, you know, developing your identity and uh, trying to feel confident about being good at something, it's like tempting to be like, yeah, that's me. I'm, I'm like so good that I don't need to uh, be polite <laughs> to anyone. I could be just an <laughs> asshole, but I'm right. still, I'm still going to make it because I'm so good that uh, it doesn't matter. They need me. Um, right. Yeah. I think maybe early on, like there, I had like a little bit of that or it's like, doesn't matter. And like, you know, it's like you can show up to work in like a, in a hoodie and, and jeans or whatever. And like right. everyone else, all the biz, biz dev people, they need to like dress up. But like the programmers, like, you know, it's like, they're the ones doing the real work and like, they can do whatever the fuck they want right, to get right. Right, because like, they can't be fired because um, they're right. essential. And so I think early on, I wasn't really prioritizing like interpersonal <laughs> skills. <maybe. laughs> and it's just like, it's all about like being a good Engineer, like, right? Uh, got my Iron Maiden shirt on. What the fuck are you gonna do, man? Yeah. I gotta uh, write the code. But then I think I think it's just important to realize that like there's no reason not to be like polite and uh, cooperative. Like it right. doesn't require any more or less effort, and it just makes everyone else's like job so much easier and more pleasant. And like they don't need to feel like like uncomfortable like asking you to do something or you know. It's just like yeah, I think just being aware of like how e everything you do is going to make someone like think about it later or like feel a certain way. And, uh, just don't want me, you know, you don't want to make right. people bad about themselves unless like it's absolutely <laughs> like necessary. <laughs> right. Uh, so, yeah. so yeah, I think, um, that makes sense. Just like try to just appreciate what other people are doing. That's good. And like, uh, reinforce that. And I think when somebody's like, when somebody's feeling confident and like appreciated, they're like way more productive and they're totally. like way more receptive to mm -hmm. feedback. And I think it's much better always to like make like get someone excited about an idea and make it feel like it's theirs and like they want to do it than to like intimidate them into right. doing what you want. Like, yeah, yeah. they're going to like do a, a shady job at right. it and do the bare minimum and resent you. And <laughs> right, right. I'll do it, but you're not going to be happy with it versus getting <laughs> excited about it. Yeah, and it, it, it re reduces the you know the tension and stuff too. People are just treating each other with respect, and it's not like oh, I got to ask for this thing, and that, that person going to freak out, and you, yeah. you know, and it's just like that weird vibe that you get in an office environment, at least where there's mm -hmm. those people where there's that tension, you know, and it just, I remember being in a game studio, there was an artist and a designer, and I'm not going to say where it was, but they were not allowed to be in a room together by themselves. So I had to be in there for meetings and to make sure there was nothing bad going down, right? And it's yeah. just like, wow, that, that's kind of crazy. It just like eats away at people when you have like a disagreement with someone and mm. you're like, you're like pissed off, like, it's just so distracting. So, oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. So I think it's just like avoiding that at all costs is like yeah. important on a, in a team, in a team environment. Yeah. Just trying to be a good human. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then 
Yeah, for you too. Like you're working with publisher and biz dev and all that. You know, for you to be receptive and be like, yeah, let me get you those screenshots or let me work in this thing instead of just mm-hmm. being like, oh, I got to ask Billy for this thing. Is he gonna fly off the handle? You, you know, like <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Some people are just like they're just like that in in their whole life. It's not just like a you know a workplace thing. They're just like, yeah. So people can just be like mean and like selfish. Yeah. Maybe they have good intentions, but they just don't. It's like something. No. have to learn right so what's been one or two of your favorite games or projects to work on i, I know mm. one of them right <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh. yeah i mean I, I have to say uh animal well it's, totally. it's also it's like the it's my favorite project also like the hardest project and oh yeah I can um, like probably at this point i've put more time into it than like almost any other project <laughs> like combined in my career but uh, <laughs> that's cool but yeah other than that i liked most of the things I've, I've worked on throughout my career and always like found sort of something to get excited about with yeah, it to be proud um, of like i did that thing right you know that kind of stuff. yeah honestly i think it was it was pretty fun working on like immortals at, at phosphor and i feel like yeah, i yeah there's like a good camaraderie on that that team yeah, yeah we, we, had, we had a good group and we had a cadence, right? Like another fighter, yeah. another fighter, got to get it out each month. <laughs> you, you know, it was like, it was, it was definitely like, you know, stressful and like, it was, a, we worked really hard, but I know there's just like a lot of funny memories. I was thinking about, um, like the Hulk Hogan, oh, like God, tobacco, right. tobacco. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Like we, we did a, or like a whole, uh, did you we know, take them out, right? I remember that whole thing. We yeah. took them out right yeah, after them out. putting them in. Uh, yeah, we did, we did a whole update where we had multiple like Hulk Hogan's in there, and then right, and his like sex, his like racist sex tape comes out like right afterwards. Yeah. And- and then we just have to like undo the update. Uh, well, it was so funny cool. too because the publisher's going back and forth, like, keep it in, take it out, keep it in, take it out. I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what do you want me to tell the team? Are we keeping them in or taking them out? It seems like we should take them out. He seems like kind of a piece of shit, but like, <laughs> yeah. what, do you, what are we doing? Because they kept, kept flip flopping. Yeah. Yeah. I think we ended up like if for the players that bought him as like a collectible. Oh. We let they keep still him, got right? to keep him in their like inventory, but then we took him off the store. So he ended up becoming this like. This like rare prize, like, right? Like collectible character that was like probably even more desirable. Right. We did that. Got, the, got the extra rare Hulk version for the, for the racist. What the game's been? I think it's Sunset, isn't it? Yeah. I, I don't think it's out anymore. I mean, it went oh, longer than I thought, but I'm pretty yeah. sure it finally got Sunset. I mean, there's been a a whole bunch of other or current. WWE games out now, but mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure Immortals was Sunset. Yeah, I remember it was it was looking bad when we had to put uh, Tap Joy into it. The ad, like, oh, movie. that's right. Yeah, <laughs> it was like, oh man, it must. It yep. must the the numbers must be dwindling if we got to like and then, like uh, WB was like very consistent with that. Like when any of their like mobile games like started like monetizing a little worse then it's like all right time for tap <laughs> like <laughs> being sent to the farm like, right it's like next stop glue factory it's like the horse yeah. that broke a leg you're like it's all like right so so uh like demoralizing to have, have to be the engineer to like put that in there <laughs> and just like knowing you're making the game worse and like slower and shittier and it, it was a lot of experiences i think like that working on mobile games and live service games and mm-hmm. games that require like all these all this like online infrastructure and middleware that like that was like a big motivator for animal well like i wanted to make a game that was complete at launch it was single player it was offline it wasn't dependent on like anything and right. i just wanted to like make a game that that i could imagine people like you know 30 years from now still playing like because mm-hmm. it like you know it just doesn't need the internet or or any like any dependencies so like in the right. same way people still like speed run you know like super nintendo nintendo like n64 games because like they're so simple they just like came on a cartridge and right you plug it in and it still works i was like trying to make something like that again when like mm-hmm. the, the general trend in the industry was like make things more ephemeral and dependent on like service stuff service, and they right. can get shut down at any point and buying a physical game is almost like pointless nowadays because you're getting like the code that's still on the disc like doesn't even work and it probably requires like 20 updates to be installed yeah. once you put it in and then uh you need to log in to something and 
right yeah, i'm just getting exhausted by like all those things and yeah uh, doing updates to play the game like oh i gotta update this thing and this thing and all that shit yeah yeah and yeah you'll go back like probably even like five years from now and there's gonna be just it's we've already seen it with like the ps3 and like ps4 generations you go back and try to play physical copies of those games and like half of them just like don't work or right yeah because it's trying to connect game, somewhere like, and it's yeah and it's like it's sad yeah but like you know for the speed run like somebody tracked me down who was playing turbo graphics games and they wanted to mm. interview me about turbo graphics and working because it was the console that yeah. no one cared about in the u.s and <laughs> sega and super nintendo crushed us but um yeah i was like wow there's like a whole industry you know and people play it that fast and yeah i people actually just that do that you know I, I had no idea about this whole like little cottage vertical of the industry yeah like the stuff can just really have a long 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 life i actually just bought the analog duo which is like the new turbo graphics like turbo graphics cd um system that oh. just got made this past year and was it the one uh, that was on amazon no i bought i had to order it from the company's called analog and they've been making like kind of these like boutique like high-end versions of classic consoles they started with the nes and then they did snes and genesis and right. their most recent one was turbo graphics they also made like a game boy like a analog pocket mm-hmm. so it could play a game boy game gear i think oh. also turbo graphics yeah game, the little hue cards that the hue there. cards yeah yeah it was an interesting platform in terms of the hardware and i see you have a sega cd player in the background which oh yeah was yeah, it Sewer of... Shark? What the hell was that game that was on Sega CD? That was. Oh, it's definitely. It, it might be the bundle with it or something. Yeah, you're right. Now that I'm dating myself, got Sewer Shark, got <laughs> Sewer Shark right in there. Yes, I remember <laughs> that. Yikes! So, what are you curious about right now in the game industry? Like, what are you excited about? Yeah, I'm. I feel like there's like a there's a lot of issues with the game industry right now, but I feel like uh, there was some like bets that didn't pay off over the past decade. Uh, with like the style of games that AAA is making, like they've kind of like gone down this road of you know making these giant open world hundred hour long games that take like right. five or six years to make and require you Tons know half a, half a billion dollars, dollars. <laughs> yeah. right? I mean, and it's like for all, it's like kind of proving to be unsustainable. And we've been seeing like you know all the layoffs and right. hardly any big games have come out this like generation, like from a lot of beloved studios like naughty dog hasn't made a new game since like the last of us two and yeah they're just so few and far between so i'm hoping like some lessons are being learned by like the people sort of at the like sea level like right yeah yeah. like sort of green lighting the projects that like it's okay to go back to like smaller scope more like maybe experimental Mm -hmm. like things that don't need to be as long but are still like high quality like interesting experiences and I just want there to be more sort of diversity in game design with like good budgets as well and good production value. I'm always excited about graphics stuff. Uh, I'm excited for like ray tracing to get better and have better hardware to, uh, Mm. to like fully like explore that. And I guess path tracing, which is just the better version of ray tracing. tracing. Uh, I'm excited about just like for the kind of the simple, (laughs) the simple stuff. Yeah, Um, I'm pretty cynical about like a lot of the trends and that have been, you know, getting talked about a lot about like cloud streaming stuff and and AI NPCs and like I think those are all like pointless (laughs) and not not gonna lead anywhere interesting. So I'm like, there's always like something, but yeah, just just excited to play more games, I guess. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Excited for the the new Switch. Yeah, I would say the Switch that gets announced. Yeah, more about that. Yeah, Switch was, has been such a, a home run, right? Like for Nintendo yeah. and, and just having some portable and it feels good and it looks great. Yeah, um, I mean, they must, I mean, people have been speculating about like the next Switch for like the past, I feel like five years. Five or years, <laughs> right, <laughs> like, yeah. It's just like an endless stream of like clickbait articles, like everything we know about Switch 2 or when it's coming like in the end of this year. And then you just know that like the original Switch is still like selling so well and Nintendo is right. zero incentive to like cannibalize it and, mm-hmm. and make something um, or just like just just keep it in the oven let's let's keep refining it because yeah. we don't have to bring it out because we're not you know in the red right like so like spend more time on it and just make it amazing and not feel the pressure of like oh our console's yeah. dead we gotta yeah so i think it like, out half-baked i think if the switch like kind of bombed we would have seen the new nintendo console like two years ago probably yeah. but because yeah. 
they're really stretching it out. And also, I think it'll be like a noticeable generational leap from compared right. to Switch. Like, right. it's it's almost like takes a little fun out of the fun out of it with like a what PlayStation Xbox have been doing because they re- are releasing these like mid gen like pro consoles, and mm-hmm. um, I feel like it's almost even hard to tell the difference between like a PS4 and a PS5 game. Like, it's like kind of incremental, and you really need like a big 4K screen and play at like a high frame rate to like really appreciate the difference so mm-hmm. but but the switch looks pretty bad right now and whatever they make next will be noticeably <laughs> right it'll be yeah so yeah. it'll it'll be like for the first time in a while where it's like oh okay this is so much better than <laughs> right yeah. had before it's like going from the the game boy to the game boy advance was like oh my god <laughs> like right and, really and, held off for like yeah. 10 years to make this and yeah and, and i remember the transition from 8 to 16 bit too and that was like that was pretty big and uh yeah. people were like oh parallax scrolling oh, look at that look at it yeah. oh my god look at that that's amazing, amazing. you know yeah, and then you got 3d games like right after that back then felt like a revel thing and uh right the, the ps1 the right that was just like yeah that was yeah. huge yeah, you go. CDs were like could store so much stuff. Yep. Um, yeah, I feel like the past few consoles that have come out just didn't haven't really felt that different. And I think mm-hmm. like half the people playing PlayStation games are still playing on like PS4. Like the yeah. generations have been so like blurry that um, most games are still like cross platform and they're coming out on both. And like, right. Um, they're still wanting to like support those old uh, consoles, even though yeah, PS4 is like 10, 11 yeah. years old now. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. What are your thoughts on AR, VR, mixed reality, that kind of stuff? Yeah, I, I was I was like really excited about it early on. Like I remember back in like 2012, you know, reading like listening to podcasts about the Oculus Rift. Uh, like oh, right. Coming out and I actually bought a dev kit for it and wow was like looking into making games for it. And, um, and then I remember we got one at phosphor and I was like super excited to like go in their mocap studio and like, yeah, set up. uh, that was actually the HTC Vive. Oh, right. I got that. one of those behind me. Yeah. So yeah, I was, uh, I think early on I was like really excited about it and, you know, like hearing everyone talk about like the sense of presence that you get and, uh, mm-hmm. how you really feel like, it's like tricking your brain into thinking you're in this space. And well, Foster had the one game, the um, the horror game, oh, the, the Bro- Brookhaven, it? yeah, Brookhaven Project. Yeah. Whatever. yeah, right. And you're like, ah, someone's behind me. I think it took a while for people to realize, like, and myself included, that like I kind of get motion sickness or a headache uh, after about right. 15 minutes of trying it on. It's like really cool, but right. It's just like, you know, heavy on your face and you get like the dent and in your forehead and your nose right. and the your pucker nose hurts yeah. and. Yeah, uh, yeah, I get a little sick from it, so it's kind of like taking the fun out of it for me. I, I still like have kind of kept up with it. I bought the PlayStation VR okay when it came out and played some stuff on that, and and I actually got the PS VR too oh. like last year, and I I only played it one evening. <laughs> it's like really sad. <laughs> it's like pretty expensive purchase, but yeah, um, and it and it is impressive. Every VR headset I've tried has been like better than the last but it's still like i don't know it's still like not good enough to like not make me feel like a little tired from using it and yeah at the end it's just like you kind of want to just take it off and play like a normal game and look at a regular screen right just look at a monitor yeah like there hasn't really been like the big budget like triple a games made for it everything still feels like a, a mini game to, mm-hmm. to some extent yeah and i, I tried playing like the resident evil uh, vr oh, right. and i just like couldn't get used to it i felt like a little dizzy like when moving the camera around i feel like it's like you're standing on a segway or something that's like <laughs> rolling forward and you're like oh my god i'm gonna like lose my balance when right. I'm, using... I'm gonna fall right in my face here yeah <laughs> well yeah. i think some people are, have uh, they're more predisposed to that to feeling motion sickness and like i, I don't get motion sickness but yeah i, I do feel after a while, after a half hour, it gets a little tiring and just the weight and everything. And yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I feel like I'll keep checking in on it every few years, and I'll probably <laughs> buy. I'll keep buying VR headsets and not using them. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't have any like desire to make a VR game anymore. Like I, I used right. to. But yeah, it's still, a, it's a cool idea. I think to yeah. keep keep uh, pursuing. What about? Uh, and you kind of alluded to it earlier, like AI and stuff like that. Like, what are your mm-hmm. thoughts? It's a similar thing i'm i'm like more 
negative on AI overall. Like, yeah, I mean, I've read a few like books about, you know, like how neural networks work and, you know, it's, there's like, it's interesting from a technical perspective, but right. just the way it's, it's just the latest kind of buzzword trend right now. And I think it's being used in places that like is only going to make the like user experience worse. And uh, I recently yeah. like watched a part of a presentation that Microsoft is like putting Copilot into like everything. It's going to be like, baked into windows yeah they have these special laptops that are coming with the copilot the with the arm chip on it and, mm -hmm. and all that yeah and they're there they they demoed like someone playing minecraft it's going to be like in minecraft now i saw uh, that demo right it's like oh that's a zombie you should build a brick uh wall or run away quickly yeah and they're like yeah. how do i craft an axe it's like oh you need the stick and you need the whatever and um I feel like whoever came up with the idea that just like knows nothing about what makes a game fun. Like, <laughs> right. It's that's, like, we're going to have like exploring it, figuring that out. Yeah, we're going to have a told. chat bot, like tell you how to play the game. And it's like, so isolating and like dehumanizing yeah. that like you, you'd get more like joy out of going on like some shitty, like banner ad filled, like forum and talking to a real person. <laughs> and like, maybe you know, right. like, you're at least interacting with a human there. Um, yeah. And I mean, I think the thing I like try to do when I'm designing games now is like, I want people to like talk to each other about it. Like I want, that's why I'm mm. like putting puzzles in there that are like, you know, really difficult. I want people to like, you know, trade those stories about playing the game and like build yeah. relationships and have it be like more than just this, like thing they do alone. I want them to like be able to talk about it. And right. Um, and so, yeah. so I think, yeah, trying to put that, in in that minecraft example like i think totally misses the point of no it was terrible i watched that and i just i was like what what, what, what why i, I don't yeah know. but then i think uh, i kind of made this prediction like a year or two ago that mm -hmm. that like ai art was gonna become like the sort of like the clip art of our generation where <laughs> where it's like kind of exciting to use at first and everyone's gonna like really abuse it and like put it in all these places that it don't right. belong. but then it's gonna like we're going to look back and it's just going to be an indicator of just like cheapness and like lack of effort and just like lack of taste. Uh, and because right. I think like when you're making art, you're, it's all about like communicating things to people. And, mm -hmm. and if you see like an ad or something, it's clearly like, they just like had like mid journey, like poop out a picture <laughs> and there's like, you know, AI spew like in it and you're going to like notice those things and you're going to be like, wow, that, that's all they did for this. They didn't, right? Yeah, yeah. They didn't really think about this at all. Like, uh, they they clearly don't give a shit. So I shouldn't give a shit, shit um, either. Um, it feels yeah. like a way to make cheaper thing, and it's not yeah. like a way to like sort of push the uh, the like state of the art forward. Um, it's just a way to like cut corners, in my opinion. And that's like yeah. at least I'm seeing it be used. So I'm not very excited about it, and I've <laughs> not been like putting a lot of effort into like yeah trying to use it. Um, yeah. And also, I just like get a lot of enjoyment out of like understanding how things work and like you know st structuring things in in a mm -hmm. specific way and and like having that sense of like craftsmanship. So yeah, I think just like a black box like neural network that's just like inserting arbitrary like randomness Which, <laughs> into, right. into like what I'm trying to do just seems like very counterproductive. I mean, I use it for work for things, but it, you know, I'm not making game art or anything yeah. like that. And I, I like your idea too, about people talking, you know, about the games. Cause like, that makes me think of the, my arcade days, right. And, and, mm -hmm. and the arcades and people would play games, you know, there was always like, you know, with Mortal Kombat, how'd you do, and again, I wasn't working on the game at the time, but like, how'd you, how'd you do that fatality? Right. And people are talking yeah. about it, but that's cool to get people t talking about it and then sharing uh, thoughts and ideas and, yeah. and um, and it, it brings that experience in a wider frame than, than the single player, because you can go in wide or you can go back to your single player experience and zoom yeah, in. Zoom yeah, out, it's like, you know, you want to tell people like what you just saw and you want to like ask questions. And I think I know like growing up, like all my a lot of my best friends like played games and it was it's like those friendships were formed based on yeah. like creating stories and mm -hmm. what you were doing and. Yeah, I think even the like single player games can be like a very social thing. and. Uh, yeah, I think ultimately people just want to like connect with each other. So uh, right. um, what either by making like art or uh, like, you know, consuming or viewing it. And mm. so I think like talking about it. Yeah, yeah I think like just uh, using AI to generate assets or um, 
any really part of it is just like diluting it and it just feels like bloat or filler or and it's like mm. something that doesn't have any intention behind it and like you can't really connect to the person making it through that right i'm sure there's always going to be like counter examples of some you know like conceptual artists like subverting your expectations right and doing yeah, something yeah. weird but like i think just the the like the 90 percent standard use case is going to be like i think it's just going to be like it's going to feel bad ultimately but i mean that's being you know used for all sorts of things i think like chat gpt is still like kind of interesting and as like a you know just a way to get some kind of question answer to a question that maybe you don't even know where to start or get like yeah starting ball. yeah and it's like kind of an interesting alternative to to google that has like right you know, gives you a little bit of a different angle on how to like ask a yeah. question but but yeah and just knowing how it works that is literally just like kind of stringing words together and right, right yeah uh what's a funny or odd story from working in the game industry I anything that stands out you want to share or? one thing that i do remember is when we we're at nether realm and we had just finished making injustice 2 mobile and i'd set up like a lot of the sort of back-end profile and like server stuff for that game and yep. we had recently launched and uh we got the tech to a uh, ban people <laughs> like working we did like uh, cheat detection so we, we were having a problem where people were like jailbreaking their devices or mm. like installing stuff so they can like sort of spoof the purchases like for, uh, everything in that game was like a microtransaction to like buy the character cards and the packs right. and all the loot boxes and everything yeah and it was like shortly after the launch we saw someone their username they're on twitch and their username was called like the hacking freak or something <laughs> uh and they were live streaming and they were the person at the top of the leaderboard with like the most uh gems or points or whatever and they were just like playing playing all day and then uh they're they're kind of just like being very pompous and bragging about how good they were at this like you know button mashing game <laughs> we like um i have this video of us like uh watching their live stream and then we like while they, they probably had like you know at least like a thousand viewers or something we like banned them live <laughs> on air <laughs> uh for for cheating and, and we got to like watch their reaction and then uh, <laughs> yeah and then he's like what the what what the <laughs> fuck and then uh, everyone in his chat was like what happened bro i thought you were legit you were the best i thought you were the best and it was just like a very <laughs> felt like so powerful to be able right. to, to just like clip their wings like <laughs> right oh uh, you, you're smart you think you're so smart cheater and eh. <laughs> yeah just like just to know it's like we just got this working and we're gonna test it out it's like having uh built the death ray and you get to like <laughs> that's something <laughs> that, that person's being really annoying over there all right, yeah. all right we're gonna test it out on them <laughs> yeah. take them out headshot yeah no that'd be funny to see that live and just <laughs> watch everyone's reactions like ah! yeah yeah, it's a, just calm as a bitch. It's just good, good times. Um, yeah, I've I've been my entire time in the industry making games, and just generally people are are just very cool and and smart. And yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a different people in the industry. I, I used to quit every decade because I was getting burned out, and I go work in more corporate stuff, and I just get so bored. I just be like, yeah, uh, these people are boring. The work's boring, and then I get psst, psst, come back, come on back. <laughs> and i keep coming back because it just yeah once you get a taste of it it's it's hard to get away from it um yeah yeah it's also just like it's so cool when you're making something that like has a really excited like fan base of people that yeah. really really take it seriously and you know they're mm -hmm. gonna go on reddit and talk about every little detail in the patch notes and right uh, they're gonna just really dissect what you're doing like um since animal well has come out it's been completely like crazy how how much work just fans are putting into uh wow. the game someone people are building like you know wikis about everything <laughs> they're they're building like FAQs, interactive tools yeah. to explore the map there's people like around the clock reverse engineering the code and like um, <laughs> and trying to build like uh, a speed routing randomizer and maybe like a level editor and oh, that's cool uh, in some ways yeah yeah it's like it's just wow. like requires so much time and, and dedication mm -hmm. just to to do those things and they're like not getting paid they just like like it and out so of passion yeah there's like uh yeah it's just very very cool to and like Where do you a see lot of, a lot of that on like discord reddit I'm, I'm guessing 
Yeah, both. Um, yeah. We have like, I don't even know what's climbing every day, but maybe like 7,000 people in our Discord. And mm-hmm. then we did a Reddit AMA yesterday. Oh, um, I did one of those a long like, time ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was like shocked that like within, you know, a few minutes, there was like 300 questions or something. Like <laughs> as soon as it started, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> like, <laughs> you're all just sitting here waiting to answer right. questions. What uh, what game are you playing right now? You're excited about gamer games? Anything you're like? Oh, uh, yeah, you right now I'm out. playing. I'm playing an indie game called uh, Crow Country, which is kind of like an homage to like a lot of those PS1 era survival horror games, like Silent mm-hmm. Hill and Resident Evil. So it looks like like really kind of chunky uh, you're right. polygon characters. And, yeah, uh, but it's kind of a, a campier, like more lighthearted version on Steam. That. I'm guessing. Yeah, it's on Steam. Yeah, yeah. I'm playing it on PlayStation. Uh, I was actually playing that before before uh, this meeting, so it's, okay. that's a good one. Yeah, the past year I've just been putting off playing so many interesting oh, yeah. games because He's, I was just, just like focus. Yeah. I had to. I, I played way too much Animal while just testing it and right. uh, bug fixing. And every weekend I was like, oh, I, like, I just need to play my own game. Unfortunately, I'm so sick of it. <laughs> but, uh, I just need to make sure that's working right. Um, and on yeah. all the console so yeah i'm excited to just go and just play a lot of different things yeah and take a little break now yeah well earned totally um anything i should have asked you about but didn't like anything we didn't cover here that we should have um no i I think you asked a lot of good stuff okay nothing i could think of off the top of my head yeah and then where can people find you online i'm on twitter and discord and mastodon and barely use I'm on, yeah barely really you do social media stuff but yeah um yeah you can go the to the that mm-hmm. has like all the links to all my social media stuff and also all the stores you can stores buy. right that's kind of like my identity at this point is like <laughs> game <laughs> funnel so through that it's like if you go to that you'll know everything about what i've been doing in my life yeah well yeah and then you can do the pre-order maybe and stuff like that too through yeah. there so oh that's cool um and then just last question like what's one piece of advice you give others working in the industry right now or trying to get it in the industry um i think just be patient and like it is it's very hard and just be ready for that and like just put the time in and yeah. try to develop the skills you need like um especially you know game video games are like very competitive and a lot of people want to make them and a lot of people yep. love playing them and yeah i guess just if you really want to do that uh just don't expect like everything to work out for you like right away and just right kind of like condition yourself to like accept you know setbacks setbacks and, and challenges it's going to take a while but just like you can still ultimately you can do it like i think mm. the the one cliche i was like think about is that like people overestimate what they can do in one year but they like underestimate what they can do in five so yeah i've heard that just like yeah i think just have that mindset when you're like applying to jobs and like learning skills and stuff well i think people get frustrated too because they're like i'm here and i want to go here and i want it to Mm -hmm. be this right and you know the reality is it's it's like a gnat right you're kind of doing this you know, to yeah. get there. And, you know, you talked about like, well, you know, I went to film school, maybe, you know, I should have just done straight engineering, but there's no way film sc- school did not influence your thinking and your visual aesthetics. Mm-hmm. And, and maybe you wouldn't have made Animal Well had you not gone to film school, right? Like, so yeah. you can't beat yourself up if it's not this perfect trajectory, right? Like you, you don't know where the path's going to go, but you just have to keep pointing at a general direction and just yeah. embrace the the unknown and the weirdness and the challenges and just not get yeah frustrated. i think just be uh just it's just as long as you're always asking yourself like if you're doing what you want or like could you be like how can you be like going in a direction that's like yeah. better and like just be self-aware of that and right just keep trying yeah trying different stuff and to your point right like do ui engineering again no i'm gonna do networking right that speaks to that challenging yourself right because i yeah that's a huge endeavor to get into that stuff with the packets and servers yeah. and all that kind of stuff and and then graphics so 
you're a good example of that. Well, thanks for being on tonight, Billy. This was great. Yeah, of course. This was great. Couldn't be more excited for your success with this game, just knowing the story and having known you since, shit, when was it, 2015? We were working together at Phosphor or something like that. Yeah, it seems right. Maybe even before 2014. 2014? Yeah, Yeah, it's like 10 years ago. Wow. Where did the decade go? That's my story. Like, I'm piling up the decades here. I'm (laughs) coming up on a big one. So I'm like, damn, where are they going? But no, it's super excited and couldn't happen to a more deserving person and congrats on oh, all that success so, so people go out check out the game go on the website play it on your platform of choice 91 metacritic can't argue with that yeah well, thank you so much for for having me this is super cool cool all right take care all right thanks bye